Our Savior holds several offices and has given several different names in Scripture. Each of them describes particular characteristics of his work for our salvation. Though they overlap, in, each, in other ways they are distinct. Sometimes we're surprised by these titles, yet each emphasizes a special relationship he has to God's plan of salvation. There are times when we read a particular verse when we're not sure whether it describes the Father or the Son. For example, let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This opening verse of the Bible is unique. The foundation of foundations. Perhaps the first words ever written down, either revealed to Adam or maybe written down by the divine one himself at the very beginning, and then passed on centuries later to Moses. One who really believes Genesis 1, verse 1, will have no difficulty believing the rest of the scriptures. The Hebrew word for God here is Elohim. He is eternal, existing before the universe. He's omnipotent. And he has created this entire universe. Therefore, nothing is impossible with God. And he alone gives meaning to everything. No attempt is made in this verse to prove he exists. It's recorded in the beginning when no one doubted God. Many people think the creator is God the Father. The Hebrew word, as I said, is Elohim. And that word was either used as a singular or a plural word in our Old Testament. In its plural form, it was translated as rulers, judges, divine ones, angels, and gods. And in its singular form, the, uh, sorry, the plural, or sorry, the singular form, translated as God, goddess, godlike one, the true God, and God. It was even applied to magistrates on occasion. 2,600 times it appears in the Hebrew Bible. But who actually performed these acts of creation of Genesis 1, verse 1? In this split sermon, we will discover who is the one who created all things. And the Bible is very clear on this point. The title of this split sermon is, Who is the Creator. Who is the Creator? Mr. Weston included this topic as point five in a recent telecast, Forgotten Truths, about Jesus. Mr. Wallace Smith included some of this in his video, Your Questions, the Bible's Answers, part two. And I wrote an article about this for our Digging Deeper column on our lcgeducation.org website some time ago. Today I'm going to be reading from what is called the greatest English classic, our King James Bible. Today, King Charles received a special edition of this Word of God called the Coronation Bible. Here's what NBC News website said about it. Quote, During the ceremony, the Archbishop of Canterbury will present the king with a specially commissioned King James Bible, on which he will place a hand as he recites his oath. He also kissed it. New monarchs have been presented with a new Bible like this since the joint coronation of William III and Mary II in 1689. Made by Oxford University Press, the book is hand-bound in leather, decorated with gold leaf. Four copies have been made, one of which will be given to Charles. The Bible which will be presented to His Majesty the King is a reminder that Scripture is not just at the heart of the responsibilities he undertakes at the coronation, but at the heart of the Christian life. Outstanding. End of quote. Outstanding statements. Now this comes from the Archbishop's website as well. Quote, 
The earliest specially produced coronation Bible in the royal collection is from the coronation of George III in 1761. Since then, a new Bible has been produced for each coronation. When, in 19, when the 1953 coronation Bible was presented to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II during her coronation, it was with the words, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing in the world that the world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. So that's the Bible I'll be reading from today on this special occasion. The word creator means one who creates, produces, constitutes the supreme being. And did you know it occurs only five times in our Bible? The first time it appears is in Ecclesiastes. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Another outstanding one comes from Isaiah. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. The word for Lord is the tetragrammaton, Y-H-V-H, defined there, and again in Genesis 21, 33, as the everlasting God. Dr. Meredith, in his January, February 2009 article, Who Was the God of the Old Testament, goes into this aspect in great detail. Again in Isaiah, another verse mentioning Creator, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. In Romans 1, who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. And the last one, wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth who is he? Let's go to John chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to see something very interesting. Because John opens his gospel with these same three words. In the beginning. John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is significant that he began his gospel this way. He obviously intended that his record should start with the same words as Genesis 1, that is, with creation. But Mr. Armstrong made very plain to us many years ago that John 1.1 chronologically comes before Genesis 1.1. The Word existed before creation. And since his explicit purpose in writing was to convince his readers that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior, he realized the foundational importance of prior belief in special creation of all things by God. People need to know that Jesus Christ is that creator against whom they have sinned. And before they can believe with understanding on him as a sin-bearing Savior, and Redeemer. A foundation of true creationism is the only meaningful context for true evangelism. It's revealed through John under divine inspiration. The word for word in John 1.1 is the Greek word logos, and it's the first of at least a dozen titles given of Christ in just this first chapter of John alone. One of the outstanding phrases from the Hebrew Bible is the Word of God, used 1,200 times in the Old Testament. And he's a personage. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
That's a very strong assertion that Jesus is God, the eternal word who was to be made man. He is God himself who came in the flesh. He's the one who created all things. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Again, we have that beginning language drawing us back to Genesis 1.1. The word of God thus was there before the creation of the space, mass, time, universe. So that John's beginning even precedes the Genesis beginning. Extending without initial beginning into eternity past, before even time was created. Later in John, Jesus says, he was with the Father and was loved by the Father before the foundation of the world. He was pre-existent. He pre-existed his own creation. He was with God. The Word of God was God, yet also with God. Therefore, we have two personages of the divine family. Now verse 3, speaking about the Word, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He made everything. He is the God of Genesis 1.1. And notice that it says things were made. They're not now being made as the concept of evolution requires. They were made. Drop down to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own people rejected him and promoted his death, turning him over to the Romans. The world was made by him. Here is another assertion that the world was made by this Logos. Yet the very men and women that he made refused to acknowledge him as their creator. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. He was that true light, physically and spiritually, the very energizer of the world. But the world preferred an evolutionary explanation without a God, and still does. The world did not know its own creator, and through his rebellion, offended him. Verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We go to him for grace. We go to him for truth. We're talking about creation science here. The first chapter of Genesis is the foundational chapter of the Bible, and therefore of all true science. It is the great creation chapter, outlining the events of that first week when the heavens and the earth were made, and then God ended his work. We go back to Genesis to chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, after these six days of creation, we read Genesis 2 verse 1. Genesis 2 verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, this very day we're observing, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because it, that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Strong emphasis here on the completion of all of our creation. A clear refutation of both ancient evolutionary pantheism and modern evolutionary materialism. The creation was complete. All its processes and laws were instilled in the operation of this marvelous universe. But God ended his work, completed creation, the universe is not now being created, but now is being conserved by this same creator, as we will see later. Verse 3, he set that day apart so we remember who he is. Every Sabbath, we are to be reminded of the God who made us 
and of this marvelous creation in which we live that we are not taking care of very well. He rested on the seventh day. He's not continuing to rest. He rested. He hallowed it for man's benefit, making it a permanent human institution, a day for rest and worship and thanksgiving to the great God for this creation in which we live. And he incorporated that Sabbath observance into the very covenant with Israel at Sinai. And Isaiah 66 says that Sabbath keeping will go right on into eternity. So we remember who made us. But who is this creator again? Let's go to Mark chapter 2. Because Mark was inspired by Christ to give us very direct reference to this creation of a Sabbath. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man. Christ and his apostles are being accused of breaking the Sabbath because they plucked some ears of grain as they were walking. And this is what Jesus himself says, as you'll see in a red letter Bible. Verse 27. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. We're not to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath is intended to serve us. Therefore, verse 28, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. If he's Lord, that means he's the creator. He's the one who instituted this law for all of humanity. It's a divine institution. He has power and lordship over it. And despite the evolutionist, Christ, or God is not creating or Christ is not creating or making anything physical in the world today except by spiritual, uh, special miracles in the lives of his people. His work was finished in that primeval week. He rested. There are three special acts of creation in Genesis 1. The creation of all things, Genesis 1.1, space, mass, and time, the beginning of physical sciences. But then he created something else. Go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 20. It didn't stop just with the universe. Then God made creatures. Genesis 1, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature. You notice the word created. This is the second great creation in Genesis 1. All these creatures, <clears throat> calling them great whales and living creatures that move, which the waters bring forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And he blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas. Let fowl multiply in the earth. The evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then a third great creation in that first creation week. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so we go from physical sciences, to life sciences, to human sciences, all in one chapter. Our bodies are analyzed chemically, our life living processes biologically, but human behavior can really only be understood in terms of our relationship to our Creator. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, a book that we believe was written by the Apostle Paul has some outstanding opening words. Hebrews 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers in the prophets. 
He spoke in various ways and at different times. To the prophets, he spoke intermittently, partially, through these prophets. But verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The Son is the creator of all things. And here the scripture notes that Christ created the space-time cosmos. He's the creator of time as well as space and all things. By whom also he made the worlds. The Greek word aeon, worlds here, embraces the idea of time as well as space and matter. Beautifully reflecting the scientific concept of the universe as a space, matter, time continuum. And when you jump over to chapter 11, verse 3, we have that word used again. Hebrews 11, verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. John 1, 1, we know who the word of God is now. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. He created these things out of nothing. But Hebrews 1, 3 shows that he sustains this universe. Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God, he sustains this marvelous universe. He's the creator. His creative abilities continued to find application during his ministry. When you go over to John chapter 6, he was preaching, and there are thousands of people who are listening to him, have been traveling with him for quite some time, didn't have sufficient food, and he works a miracle. John 6, starting in verse 9. John 6, 9. The disciples report to Jesus that among the crowd was a lad who had five barley loaves and two small fishes. But they asked, well, what are these among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, when he had given thanks, distributed to the disciples, and disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. He takes these few loaves and fishes and creates them to sufficient food to feed thousands of people at one time, showing his creative powers again on earth. When we go to chapter 2 of John, we read about his first miracle. John 2, starting in verse 7. John calls these miracles signs, and there are seven of them in the Gospel of John. John 7, starting in verse 2. And both Jesus was called. Sorry, John 7. Sorry, John 2. John 2, verse 7. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. He was at a wedding with his mother, all the other celebrants, but they had run out of wine. And so his mother informs him of it, and Jesus instructs the attendants, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. But the ruler of the feast had tasted, when he tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine till now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and many and, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The first of seven great miracles in John. John describes in order to persuade his readers that indeed Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. 
He displays again his creative power in instantaneous creation, turning that water into something more complex, wine. His creative powers brought forth life from non-life. John chapter 11, starting in verse 43. John 11, 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. This is when Lazarus had died. His sister sent a message, please come. This is before he died and heal my brother. But Jesus delays. Lazarus dies. He's buried. He does go to the cemetery. Starting in John 11, 43. As they opened the tomb, when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin or a cloth. And Jesus said to him, them, loose him and let him go. He brought life out of non-life. Like in Genesis 1, Life from non-life. The last and greatest of the seven miracles of Christ is this one of raising Lazarus from the dead. And the result, verse 45, many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. That's why John includes that in his book. To show that these miracles convinced people who he was. He was the creator Although at least three of these seven miracles, the people that witnessed it were more determined than ever to kill him. Let's go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, another sign of his divinity as being the creator. Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 4. Mark 2, 4, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press... This is the time when Jesus is preaching in a home. People are crowding in. And there were so many people that a lame man could not get in to see Jesus to be healed. So when they could not come near him for the crowd or the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy of paralysis lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the man, the palsy, Son, your sins be forgiven you. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? They knew what Jesus had done, and they knew that was a sign that he was God. He had forgiven this man's sins. A sign of his creatorship. Here's another one. Matthew 24. We could read right over words like these, and yet they are so important. That's why it's important to stop, read the words closely, and analyze. What do they say? Matthew 24. Verse 31. Speaking of the end times. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Did you notice what he called those angels, the possessive? He shall send his angels. Again, we can read right over that. I'll have to admit, I've read that so many times, and yet in this research, it jumps out at me. His angels. Let's go to the book of Colossians. Paul writes this book to a troubled church. It's an epistle. And they were being infected with a heresy. And he writes them in part as an antidote to the error that was spreading quickly in this church. It was a complex set of heresies that were infecting the church. But in that midst of this Moving letter, Colossians 1, verse 12, he says some important things that are current to our sermon. Colossians 1, verse 12, giving thanks 
to the Father, which has made us meet or suitable or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated or transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He talks about us being delivered from the powers of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. We were once held captive slaves in that kingdom, but we're heading for a new kingdom that we heard about in our first split sermon today. But in verse 14, in whom, in our creator, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We receive freedom and forgiveness through the shed blood of our creator. He came out of love for his people. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, a clear affirmation of the absolute deity of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Spiritual, omnipotent, omniscient, holy. The word image conveys all of this. As he said earlier in John, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He's the firstborn, the only begotten Son. He's from eternity to eternity. Some are sons of God by creation, like the angels. Others become sons of God by being born again into God's kingdom. But he is the son, the only begotten of the Father. He is totally unique. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians and Ephesians, these two epistles, share much similar content. And there's another verse in Ephesians which says this, very similar. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. That was a commission that the Father gave to the Son to create all things. And this is the one who is the Word. This is the one by whose shed blood we are redeemed. Christ is the Creator, not the Creator as some heretical teachers such as the Arians once taught, and in some even Christian groups still teach. The Defender Study Bible says, Jesus Christ certainly is not a created being, not even the first created being, as many have argued, for the obvious reason that he himself is the creator of all things in heaven and earth, material and spiritual, visible or invisible. Only God can create, and God did not create himself. End of quote. Henry Thayer's Greek lexicon, Greek English lexicon, for the words all things in verse 16, ta panta, the universe of all things, the totality of created things. The NIV study Bible notes that seven times in verses 15 to 20, Paul mentions all creation, all things and everything, stressing that Christ is supreme over it all. And so therefore, we have to understand he sacrificed everything to come down to our earth as our savior as well. The creation includes all things, including things invisible to us. He talks about spiritual creatures in verse 16. The New King James Study Bible says, um, no, the ESV Study Bible says Paul is using the current Jewish terms for various rankings of angels. His emphasis here may be on the evil angels since they play a significant part in this letter. He calls them 
creatures who occupy thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. They were good angels when he made them. They turned bad when they rebelled against the Almighty with Satan. This was part of the Colossian heresy. Worship of these angelic creatures was part of this multifaceted Colossian heresy. The New King James Study Bible says this, this idea is in direct contradiction to the false teaching, later known as Gnosticism, that was developing in the Colossian church. In general, Gnostics believe that various angelic beings were the creators of the earth and that Christ was one among many of these angels. Only one of many. No wonder Paul is vehement in writing this letter to brethren whom he loved. The Henry Marr Study Bible says, quote, the pagan world, whether of the ancient Greeks or modern New Agers, has always believed in angels, demons, or spirit beings of various types and powers, and it's vital for us to understand that such beings do exist and can wield great influence in the invisible world as well as the invisible. Many have rebelled against him, both men and angels, always justifying themselves by maintaining they are the products of some cosmic evolutionary process instead of creation by the eternal, transcendent God. All things were created by him and, verse 16, for him. The end of verse 16. Created for him. The preacher's complete homiletical commentary says, it's a narrow philosophy that teaches that all things were made for man. The grand end of all our endeavors should ever be the glory of Christ. All things were made for him. We're talking about the grand scheme known as the great plan of salvation of our God. The universe is here for a reason. And we're all potentially part of this redemption project. Christ intends to add to his family. The family of God and restore his creation. He's already given us some derivative and limited creative powers because we're made in the image of God. But we need to depend on the creator himself to use them wisely. Prepare yourself for a future of expanding creativity. That's our bright future. Verse 17, he is before all things, and by all things, by him, all things consist. Stand together, hold together the principle of cohesion. If the creator were not alive, this universe would come apart. He keeps it running. Matthew Henry's commentary says, they not only subsist in their beings, but consist in their order and dependencies. He not only created them all at first, but it is the word of his power that is by the word of his power they are still upheld. The whole creation is kept together by the power of the Son of God and made to consist in its proper frame. It's preserved from disbanding and running into confusion. Christ is the conserver of creation as well. The controlling and unifying force in nature. Robertson's word picture says, the Gnostic philosophy that matter is evil and was created by a remote aeon is thus swept away. God's son whom he loves is the creator and sustainer of the universe, which is not evil. The matter is evil was part of this Gnostic heresy. So Christ refutes it by inspiring Paul to write this marvelous letter. Christ's creation spiritually continues. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He is still at work among people who surrender to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Second Corinthians 5, 17, Paul writes, Therefore, if any man, any person be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
Christ has a spiritual creation underway. He's the mediator of new relations between the sinner and God. He took the creator himself to be part of this program of redemption. He is performing that every day in the lives of repentant sinners to turn them from sin unto himself. The miracle of being begotten again and baptized by the Holy Spirit into the spiritual body of Christ is a true miracle of special and spiritual creation. Do we realize that? We need to stop and think about what is happening in the lives of God's people. How different our lives would be if God had not called us and begun this project of transforming us into his own likeness. From rebellion against him to total submission, we're being renewed in knowledge. Let's go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Day by day as we grow, we're becoming more like our creator. If we are motivated by the Holy Spirit, and we are overcoming sin. Christ's work of new creation should be evident in the lives of his people. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, old word for conduct. Put off the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts. Have we really put him off, her off, and be renewed, verse 23, in the spirit of your mind? That's the Holy Spirit's presence working with the spirit in man. In verse 24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's the project Christ is working on today because he's alive. The fact that we're here is evidence that the Creator exists. As we look back at our former lives, we realize what changes have been made. We realize the Creator has made that possible. That is evidence of his existence, that he is in charge and he knows what he's doing. I want to give you three lessons to think about as we end up this split sermon lessons for us. Number one, this truth of who is our creator will make our prayers all the more meaningful as we pray to Jesus Christ, our creator and redeemer. We're talking to the one who made all things, who came to earth as the word of God and gave up his own life so we would have hope of eternal life. Number two, this truth will move us to appreciate creation as the handiwork of our Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. We need to take much better care of this planet that Christ told us to manage and care for all the way back in the Garden of Eden to dress and keep. And we have failed in that assignment. We are not good sustainers of all that he has given us. We need to do a better job at that. Number three, God's plan includes the redemption of creation itself as portrayed in the final two chapters of the book of Revelation. He's going to remake all things and we're going to live on into eternity in a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem wherein dwells righteousness. Godspeed that day. Christ is not only our Savior, but before that, He was our Creator. He deserves our adoration and worship, and in Him, we live and move and have our being.